right. Um, next, we have Hester. Um, but I just want to quickly mention that stick with us uh, because uh, we have another talk after Hester as well. Um, we are going to see very inspiring and award-winning data visualizations from Jan, and he's going to take us through his process uh, for data visualization or creative data visualization. So don't go anywhere, stick around. But our next speaker is wonderful, Hester. She is also a senior researcher with years of experience working with big techs and startups. And I've had the pleasure to know her closely and I have worked with her in the past as well. It's always very inspiring for me to see how much care and innovation he puts, uh, she puts in her work. She is currently working with Status.im, which is a fully remote company defining the future of decentralized web with worthy principles like privacy. You should check them out. I think they are hiring for a remote senior product designer at the moment. Yes, we are. Good. <laughs> and today she is taking us through a cross-country research project she conducted on blockchain and cryptocurrency. Take it away, Hester. Thank you, Pesa. Uh, and I must say, it's uh, I, I feel fortunate for being able to follow up on, on Bayan's presentation because I get to uh, fully embrace my fear of, uh, fear of failure uh, before presenting and actually like had the chance to take a moment and, and, and set an intention. So thank you for that, Bayan. Um, yeah, so um, tidbits of UX research in crypto. A brief introduction about myself. Um, yes, I'm a UX researcher. I'm a team lead of a design team. I occasionally do some designs myself, but I'm uh, happy to work with uh, people who are way better at, uh, at design uh, than I am. Um, one thing that I thought might not shine through in uh, the bio I shared ahead of this talk is that I uh, I used to work for ING and actually um, signed the banker's oath uh, back in, in 2015 when it was introduced. Um, and coincidentally, that was also around the same time that I started to take an interest in, in Bitcoin, blockchain, later on Ethereum. Um, so you, you could say that um, somehow I ended up uh, changing, um, sw switching teams, working for a different different type of bank now, um, a, a decentralized bank where, where you can uh, sort of, in a way, be your own bank. Um, after I took an interest in, in Bitcoin blockchain. Initially, I started learning a little bit more about Ethereum and, and uh, that's how I ended up um, at Status uh, as a UX researcher. Um, and I know my talk said something about crypto and honestly, if it comes to like setting intentions and um, my intention being that I want to uh, share a, a specific story, a specific direction, um, I don't want to talk too much about crypto. It might creep in here and there. Um, I actually do want to talk a lot more about the web. Um, web has gone through an evolution that I think is, is quite familiar to all of us, where we, we used to have this web that was only kind of like information sharing, right? And you could read that information, um, going to allowing anyone to read and write, um, posting information, um, like sh sharing your life on, on Facebook, sharing your um, uh, your home on, on Airbnb and things like that. Uh, a lot has changed uh, when we moved to um, Web 2.0, which uh, I suppose have been uh, around for about 15, 20 years by now. Um, and what, I, what I'm particularly interested in is this concept of, of Web 3. Um, if you look at um, Wikipedia, which is where you go if you want to look for a definition of uh, when preparing a presentation. Um, if you go to Wikipedia, there's actually not too much on Web3. Um, it's a little more than a side note um, on the topic of semantic web, um, which was introduced uh, years ago, um, but never seems to have really taken on that um, defining role for Web3. Um, so yeah, it's still a little bit fake, a little bit undefined. So uh, I was thinking like, what do you do when Wikipedia doesn't give you a definition? Um, ask Twitter. Um, so I, I went on Twitter and I looked at what are the things that come up um, when I when I search for Web3 on, on Twitter. Um, definitely a little bit biased because Twitter Twitter algorithms and my personal uh, bubble, uh, but some of the things that come up when, when I look into Web3 are 
cryptocurrency, blockchain, decentralized, decentralization, NFT, Doge, um, DeFi, uh, and a lot of other um, new new lingo, new um, yeah, new new unfamiliar words come up. Um, so there was uh, kind of a, a, a first step into um, kind of understanding like how how would Web three be defined? And there's obviously some definitions out there. Um, another another um, thing that happens when you actually then dive into that rabbit hole or start to like read more about cryptocurrency, some other things pop up, um, which is wraps kitties and uh, a lot of a lot of dogs actually a lot of dogs doge um sheep or sheep uh, less of shiba shiba inus especially the ones going to the moon because that's what every cryptocurrency is supposed to do uh go to the moon in terms of value uh you find a lot of references to lambos when lambo when you're gonna get enough money to to buy your lambo uh, your lamborghini and you've got a lot a lot of food references um a lot of unicorns and a lot of food so sushi yam uh all things like that um more unicorns you get um bunny shaped pancakes um and this is then supposed to be this new web um it all sounds a little bit silly um it all sounds a little bit like why why would anyone want to invest any time in that um it seems superficial let's put it like that um and it seems a little bit difficult to understand or grasp why that why anyone would take an interest um in that almost in a way that it seemed silly to start thinking about an internet and what an internet could mean to people um so this is kind of why I want to share some some stories. This whole um, Web3 notion and cryptocurrency notion comes with its uh, connotations that are, are perhaps a little bit uh, superficial. Um, and as a UX researcher, I've actually um, spent the last three and a half years trying to understand uh, what then drives adoption for cryptocurrency and, and um, related, related technologies, uh, underlying technologies. Um, some of these stories, I think, um, pose an answer. Um, and then there's always uh, a lot more questions that they, that they call on, right? So to, to start off with a first story, um, back in November of 2018, um, me and research colleagues uh, over at Status, we, we visited South Korea, we visited Seoul. Um, and one of the main reasons um, that we visited, um, specifically South Korea, had to do with the kimchi, what's called the kimchi premium. Another one of those uh, fun crypto, crypto related um, terms. Excuse me. Um, kimchi, kimchi premium is actually something that's cropping up again. And it, it refers to the demand for uh, particular currencies being so high in, in South Korea that, that like relatively speaking, Bitcoin's more expensive to get there uh, at an exchange than anywhere else in the world, right? So we wanted to understand why is that? Why it's particularly in, in South Korea is um, cryptocurrency going through such a boom, such a such hype, um, and we see that happening now again. Um, when we were there, we visited people at home, we talked to a local research partner, and we started to get this understanding that it's it's actually about a lot more than quick profit uh, or making money. Um, there's a whole socioeconomic system behind this drive to to buy buy cryptocurrencies. Um, one of the kind of it's it's a combination of factors, but one of the things that that stood out um, is this idea of uh, younger generations simply wanting to leave the house. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. It's not easy to leave the house. And with that, I mean your parental parental home. Um, it's not easy to leave that, that home. Um, reason being is that it is very expensive. The housing market is extremely expensive. It's very expensive to find your own place. Um, outside of work, there are very little types of investments that can actually help you kind of raise the capital that you would need. Um, the stock market is biased towards business investors, not too friendly to retail investors. Um, so it's, it's kind of difficult to get like permission uh, for certain types of trading. Uh, and then on top of that, there's a lot of social pressure. 
Um, there's a whole generation that grew up um, with their parents kind of living through what they call the miracle of hum, um, having reestablished a such a like prosperous economy in such a short amount of time uh, that there's this very strong sense of obligation that like you shouldn't go for um, seeking ways to leave the house. But what you should go for is help build that economy, go work for Samsung, right? Um, so there's a lot of social pressure around it as well, um, which combined then then um, seem to lead to this like pool of crypto, making making it a lot more interesting um, in, in South Korea than other countries. And I try to kind of relate back some of the principles behind, uh, especially permissionless blockchain technology, um, to understand why is it that particularly crypto then would, would offer a solution, right? Um, which again, one of the reasons being that it's permissionless. Well, it's very difficult to get onto the stock market and um, being a retailer, make a good profit there. Um, within this crypto world of Web3, you can anyone can do anything. Um, so it's, it's actually um, much easier to get started. Um, Similarly, you don't need a lot of capital to get started, which is which is a barrier. I might get back to that later as well. Wealth creates wealth. And if you don't have a lot to start from, it's very difficult to start investing in most cases. Uh, in crypto, you need a few dollars and your phone, and that's about it, right? Um, moving back, moving forward <laughs> from, from Seoul in, in South Korea, we then actually um, kind of went on a, a tour uh, through Asia to, to China. Um, and in China, I met a, a ambassador, a community manager um, for Status, um, and he, he shared an interesting um, story with me. Um, there's a video, I'm not sure if you can hear the audio, um, but here's in any case the video, worst, worst case you miss out on uh, the wonderful music in the background. And so I can imagine that you're wondering here, what, like, what, what the hell am I looking at, right? Um, not sure if I can pause it. Um, so SNT is the network currency that um, Status as, as a product, as, as a network, um, uses. And in this video, someone is sharing a package that has been um, sent um, in exchange for SNT. Um, so what the, the community manager, Stephen, um, explained to me was that actually there is this whole active community, a Chinese community, which obviously I, I couldn't um, read too much about their conversations, uh, that was setting up a, a marketplace uh, with the first person to sort of initiate that marketplace offering mushrooms for that were in the end sold for about 200,000 uh, SNT. I think it was about $9 at the time. Um, not magic mushrooms, no illegal mushrooms, but very special mountain mushrooms. And um, I'm, I'm not sure um, if you're familiar with kind of the, um, the food culture um, in China. There's a, lot to, there's a lot that has been said about that. Um, but definitely there is, uh, there's always this strife for finding like the unique special um, uh, delicacy that's, that's difficult to come by. And these mushrooms were, were one of them. Um, so thinking again, like what what makes it about this idea of cryptocurrency and um, more broadly Web3 that is um, interesting to use if you just want to sell specific, a special type of mushroom uh, mushrooms to someone else. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons that makes a permissionless a blockchain or any blockchain interesting is that it's the it's referred to as trustless. It's supposed to be trustless. Of course, you have to trust the technology. You have to trust the validators, the contracts, the auditors. There's a lot of people you have to trust along the way. Um, but once um, you're using a somewhat mature product, you can exchange value with anyone, whether it's mushrooms for S&T or something else, um, with no intermediaries, right? Um, this person didn't have to go on Etsy and Etsy like claiming some commission um, to, to act as a trusted party in between. Uh, in order to sell this, um, these mushrooms. So th th that's an interesting um, aspect uh, that would drive 
uh, to use a, a particular blockchain. The other thing is that it's public, right? And that, that leads into it being trustless. You can see exactly when the transaction has been made. So you can see exactly when um, it's, it's a good time for you actually to go and send that package. And then lastly, um, actually, I think I might have one more, more item here. Um, one thing that's very interesting is that your identity on a blockchain is like it's it's a string of like letters and numbers like it's really not much more than that um you're an address your identity is an address uh, and that makes you pseudo anonymous um especially in in some countries like like china or anywhere where you would have reason to protect your identity from um, being connected to, to some activities, whether illegal or, or immoral, uh, being pseudo anonymous has, has its benefits there. And then the last one, um, I think particularly relevant in, in China, um, where uh, status as a product, product was, was used, is that um, a blockchain, a permissionless blockchain, becomes in a way censorship resistant as long as there are enough people participating in a network to validate what transactions happen or to validate, um, or let's say, to, to relay um, messages, if it's about a, a messaging network that, that status works on. If you have enough people acting as a node, as a, as a validator or a relayer in that network, it becomes very difficult to shut down. You can shut down maybe the power on, uh, on one party, uh, but if there's like hundreds of thousands left, um, what do you do, right? Um, so that's also considered one of the one of the benefits there. Uh, and then what what kind of happened was uh, they ended up making a very health, happy, healthy mushroom meal. Uh, again, not magic mushrooms. So moving from from China to Venezuela, <laughs> other part of the world in in South America, very different type of use case. Um, this is probably a well-known fact. Um, Venezuela hit hyperinflation uh, for various reasons. It's also an embargoed country. Um, dollars um, were doing business with um, American companies, not allowed. Dollars were for a long time uh, banned from uh, by the uh, by the government of Venezuela itself. Um, this is in the picture. You see a participant that that we talked to um, that is the partner of someone who actually migrated. About 5.2 million people migrated to Venezuela, which is a lot for a country of, I believe, 30 million people. Um, her partner, uh, as I recall, is in Colombia or, or Chile and um, sends funds back to uh, her so she can support herself and, and their baby. Um, Crypto transactions are a very common method uh, among people in similar situations to the, the woman we talked to, um, to share funds cross-border. Um, the remittance market is um, an incredibly big, uh, profitable uh, market, but it's also uh, very costly for individuals to send remittances across borders. Um, so again, I'm not sure if there if you can hear any audio. I don't speak Spanish either. This is my colleague explaining um, how people similar in, in a similar situation actually do send um, uh, crypto funds back and forth uh, to each other uh, using an application. Uh, so that's a very very common use case. There's actually been a connection between um, a Bitcoin blockchain transactions and a power outage in Venezuela. Um, where you can clearly see a drop in activity when there's a power outage in, in Venezuela, uh, which only points to um, kind of behind the scenes how intensely that is being used. Another example from Venezuela, and I, I find this, uh, this one of the most striking images. There are loads of images that you can find uh, online and we took some some similar pictures while we were there um, that shows uh, Bolivar being used as almost as toilet paper um, <laughs> being uh, worthless um, it, like there's really you might as well burn it and have something to watch right um, and what I, I think is striking is this um, kind of image of um, one of the larger stores um, run by the government where you buy diapers by the piece right 
um, when you get to the point that you have to calculate if you can afford a diaper for your baby by the piece. Um, that, that's hyperinflation. Um, what we've seen a lot of people do in, in that scenario is that they, they that look for um, a store of value because the, the money that you earn one day might be completely worthless the next day. Um, so this is um, where Bitcoin especially is, is appreciated. Um, obviously getting, getting funds on Bitcoin, out of Bitcoin, there's, there's a lot of hassle and costs involved there as well. Um, but if you have no stable currency um, of your own nation, if you have no access to a stable currency um, of another nation uh, because you're embargoed, um, that is the direction that uh, people t seem to tend to go to. Um, Comparing a little bit here, um, Bitcoin blockchain versus Ethereum blockchain, which are some of the two major chains. Um, there's also the concept of pro just being programmable uh, money that you like pro programmable contracts that run on these chains, um, which allow to create stable coins, whether these are then uh, pegged to a stable fiat currency. So if you can't access dollars, you might like X is a stable coin that is back to a dollar, same value, um, or that's uh, in some other way um, algorithmically um, stabilized uh, based on demand. Um, so these are these are some of the ways in which um, uh, cryptocurrencies offer relief in those scenarios. Passing um, again to a, a different continent, uh, to Africa, Nigeria. Um, unfortunately, no in-person research there. Um, COVID and all. Um, so we ended up um, running a, a survey to understand what drives crypto adoption in Nigeria. There's been a, a publication by Statista earlier this year uh, about their global research that said 35 respondents from Nigeria reported that they, they own and use cryptocurrency. Um, probably don't have to tell this audience, but statistics, there's a lot to say about like 35% really, um, but it is high compared to other countries. And that was very interesting uh, to us and also to, to investigate for ourselves what, what's happening there. Um, some of the draws there is not necessarily like this idea of censorship resistance. Um, it's this idea of being able to access wealth to begin with. And this is what I mentioned a moment ago, wealth, create wealth creates wealth. Um, there are a lot of people who don't have that wealth to begin with uh, that are therefore locked out of um, in investment and opportunities to grow in prosperity. Um, so what a lot of people in, in Nigeria end up doing is using uh, what's called DeFi, decentralized finance, um, which again is this permissionless access. All you need is a phone um, and accessing uh, an application and a few dollars to start from. Uh, and that's where this quote comes from. Uh, I have used my cake to farm other tokens on pancake swap um, all sounds a bit surreal um, i think people are definitely like looking for ways to make this this technology um, sound and, and seem approachable um, but essentially it says i went on to adapt and i i provided liquidity i, I offered some of some of my to tokens uh, of one type uh, as an investment to earn interest um, and thereby uh, kind of in increase my own wealth. Um, so again, DeFi services are uh, key in, in Nigeria, it seems. One last example, uh, and then I suppose I should start wrapping up as well. Um, this, this occurred last week when I was preparing for this talk. I, uh, I figured like, what other examples are there out there? And then I reassured myself thinking, oh gosh, there's something new crops up in this world every every other week or so. Um, and so, yes, last week, um, this transaction happened. Um, and if you look a few rows down, you can see they're from VB, um, which is from Vitalik Buterin, um, the author and one of the founders of uh, Ethereum Foundation, author of the Ethereum white paper, who sent uh, Shiba Inu ship to um, a COVID relief fund um, in India. Um, now, there's a lot to say about like the actual value here. It was valued at $1, $1 billion at the time. Um, if there's no liquidity, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that much. Um, 
what it does show though is uh, this, this use case of uh, tracking donations. Um, this fund in your COVID crypto fund um, receives all its funds in cryptocurrency. And so you can um, track exactly where that money goes to what other addresses it might be sent. Um, and that's uh, yeah, one, of the, one of the cases that makes um, this, this technology in some scenarios just very uh, beneficial. So, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, a common, common thought around uh, cryptocurrency, especially when you say like permissionless and, and censorship resistance is um, that's shady, that allows for a lot of illegal activity to happen. Um, and I think we all know that like, that, like the, the shady activities happy, happen regardless. Um, one last example I would want to share is um, getting a national national fiat currency. Um, when going to Venezuela, we were recommended get dollars, get lots of dollars, make sure they're um, uh, like the, the notes don't have any, any uh, what do you call it, creases, crevices, um, that they look like shiny and new, uh, that gets, gives them the most value to get a lot of dollars. So that's what we did. We went to multiple ATMs to get enough dollars, um, uh, actually enough, um, Colombian pesos to then go to an exchange and exchange those for dollars. So we had this whole stack of dollars um, to to bring. Um, this is the result of what I what I got after that. So with with the dollars that I brought, um, when you then enter Venezuela, um, yes, dollars are useful, but there is also a whole market where you where you still need Bolivar. Um, ATMs are empty. You can go to an ATM. Um, citizens can go to their their branch of their bank uh, where they can get maybe on like good days the amount that equivalent is the equivalent of like a bunch of bananas um, not more than that um and they can only they're only allowed to go once a day um so yes bolivar as a currency is still required at the same time so hard to come by um so what we ended up doing was going to like an illegal money dealer um, to exchange those dollars for, for Bolivar. Um, illegal one, because of the exchange, uh, because it's it's an illegal exchange that the government doesn't earn any money on. Uh, and number two, because it was very likely drug money as the, as the seller informed us. Um, so shady, there's a, a lot of things that can be shady, um, not necessarily immoral. Um, there's one thing I would want to leave you with is, um, if you see a lot of dogs and cats uh, when you read about crypto uh, or a lot of Elon Musk pictures going to the moon, um, yeah, please also know there's there's a whole global community out there um, that beyond the cryptocurrency is is building this new type of web, this Web three, um, and there are also a lot of people that that benefit from some of the services um, or benefit from this the, the technology, and uh, for them it does serve a real purpose. So. Uh, that's what I wanted to leave you with. Um, yeah, again, my name is Hester. I work for Status. Um, please join me there. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on Status, similar to uh, uh, checking out uh, Twitter. Um, you'll be linked to install the application, and then uh, it's easy to start a chat. So I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Hester. That was fascinating. Um, and it's uh, really interesting that the specific characteristics of Web3 and cryptocurrency, like low entry barrier, trustless, no identity censorship resistant, make it really uh, possible for people to appropriate it based on their context and their needs. And uh, it makes up for really interesting cases and un unexpected case, unexpected cases. Um, so I'm going to encourage people to share their learnings or questions in the chat. And while they'll do that, I'm going to ask you a question about uh, blockchain in general. So there's a common discussion uh, in that primary blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum use a technology that costs a lot of energy. And um, so it's a fair question here to ask. Are the benefits worth it? Um, also considering the environmental impact, or do you think that will change in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely a fair question, and I think it's it's debated about it. Like, 
every single day um, in the space. Um, there's there's a lot of views on it. Um, one thing that I would say is that most people do agree that it is a problem that needs fixing, right? Um, so there's definitely not um, not a lot of um, climate uh, change deniers <laughs> um, in the space, if you will. Um, so given the impact that I've seen uh, personally, um, pretty like far reaching in, in terms of like the effect it has on people's personal life, being able to do things that otherwise you would not. Um, just this week, I was, I was talking to a, a colleague in the space who like really got into trouble because he couldn't get a loan. Um, that, that type of story might not reach us every day, uh, but it happens a lot. So like in, in my view, this um, transition of power, like going, uh, like whether it's financially or or in terms of governance, um, this transition of power that the technology enables is pretty impactful. Um, not to say that then um, climate is is not a concern, but I would rather than focus on how are we going to solve that problem. Um, there are a lot of uh, efforts going into switching between different consensus um, mechanisms, if you will. Um, going from proof of work to proof of stake, all of that is going to take time. So if you think about any um, modern company going through digital transformation, I don't know, it was maybe uh, like four or five years ago, every large company was going through digital transformation. And yes, that takes a couple of years. Um, this is a, like a billion dollar um, like a, an application that multiple applications that have tons and tons of value in it. So it's, it's going to take time. Um, but I am definitely optimistic about the developments that I'm seeing. Um, and I also know like more close by that um, Status is working on um, making light clients, so light validators that actually run on uh, devices that don't need a lot of power, like the Raspberry Pi. Um, then just to add to that, there are, if you think about Web3 as the broader concept, there are so many applications that you can think of that do not necessarily require the security properties or the, the energy use that, that the blockchain itself does um, that you can still use like messaging. Yeah, nice. Thank you for that. And you mentioned that, um, yeah, Web3, uh, there is a whole community around it and defining it beyond cryptocurrency, uh, of course. Um, and you're working status whose mission is actually defining this future. So I'm curious what uh, aspect of uh, this new technology interests or excites you the most? Hmm. This, what aspect? So I got I go in between. I'm I'm not too much of a financial aspect um, uh, expert. So the whole decentralized finance uh, movement uh, hasn't really meant too much to me. Uh, but if I then hear about the the personal examples close by of people saying, well, actually, be, because of these services, I was actually able to get um, a loan or able to access um, credit that otherwise I really wouldn't have access to. So I find that very very promising. Uh, Plus, and this is something on the other side of like Web3, um, I think we all know the um, complexity and challenges of social media companies. Um, one of the challenges is also being that they are centralized companies that have a lot to say. Um, and their decision power is based on economic incentives. Um, that doesn't necessarily result in best decisions for um, any news that we get, any uh, governance that, that is the result from that. Um, especially the products that uh, Status is building is target targeting also that area of Web3. So bringing more control to individuals rather than an economically incentivized uh, large corporation to make those decisions. Yeah, very powerful indeed. Um, so there is a question in the chat, as a designer, given the drastic changes in the technology, how can we make more informed decisions about the digital transformation of crypto products? I'm just uh, <laughs> absorbing the question. Um, so is this about digital transformation? Um, this is what I'm wondering, thinking out loud. Is this about the digital transformation to crypto products um, or yes. the impact it would have for designers? Um, so if so, I think one of the um, um, ways to make more informed decisions, 
I think I've, I've said this again, different forums is to start spending at least 50% of our time focused on the technology and don't take uh, an answer for granted that yes, we use this single sign-on service because that's easy. We have an API for it, uh, but to actually start learning about how uh, some of the building blocks work um, because that's where a lot of the incentives come from. That's why or when uh, Amazon web servers are used instead of another solution that might also serve the same purpose. Um, especially like over the last three years, three and a half years, I've kind of been forced to learn a lot in depth about how the technology works. And I'm definitely not there like learning something new every day, um, but it, it shifts perspectives about what can be done. Uh, and I think that's very critical for, for more designers to understand that some of the proposals we make, some of the techno underlying technology we use is at fault here and it can be changed. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I guess taking not taking no for an answer sometimes uh, <laughs> because uh, because uh, sometimes we think that that's not possible, but when you dig into it, maybe it is possible technology technologically yeah. speaking. Um, and it, it, yeah, join the the design community on status. Um, send me a message. Uh, I think just being connected to that community and other communities that are, that are more tech driven or finding a closer connection to engineering definitely helps here. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, I think, all of the questions in the chat. Um, thank you again for sharing your experiences um, and really these uh, fascinating stories with us. It was, uh, it was eye opening. Thank you, Pesach.